There's the tape. <laughs> yeah, it's it was a fantastic. The tape. Yeah, that was a fantastic uh, little discussion we had there, right, right on, uh, on the topic of our talk. Right on here. you, excellent. So uh, thank you, Alona, and uh, it's great to see a lot of familiar faces and some new new ones as well. And welcome to our colleagues from the TPMA as well. Hope everyone enjoys the talk. Um, this talk is really about getting more value from UX research by uh, optimizing the interactions between somebody requesting the research and the researcher uh, delivering it. Uh, and we'll look at two interactions. We'll look at how requesters uh, pose questions uh, for research they want research on. Uh, and then we'll look at how the researcher packages and presents those results or the, the answers back to the requester. So we have a pretty diverse audience here. So I'll just clarify a few terms. So uh, by requester, I just mean anybody who requests research or is going to use the results. That could be you know, product managers, owners, designers, strategists, executives, just, you know, Quite a wide range of people uh, have some uh, come to uh, researchers uh, with requests for, for research. Uh, and I'll be just using the, the short form researcher researcher to mean UX research, which you know is the kind of research we're talking about here. You know, also known by other names like user research or design research. Um, we'll be talking a lot about the interactions between these people. So sometimes when I say we, I mean you know, researchers or sometimes I mean all of us, but that should be clear from the context. Um, so to uh, prepare today's talk, I looked through my collection of uh, research practices that I've uh, kind of accumulated over the years, and I've chosen four tracks to share with you. Um, I'll be uh, covering each topic mostly by using examples, and these examples come from you know, various domains that I've worked in over the years, but I'll present them in a very generic format so you can see how they might apply to your domain, whether that's you know, something in B2B or, or B2C or b to something else. Uh, so this talk is intended to be uh, fun and interactive. So uh, we'll do a few polls as we go along. And as well, after each uh, track, I will uh, pause and turn it over to you. So um, I hope uh, and I'll invite people to uh, share their perspective on the topic I've presented or share their stories you know, you know, you know, in addition to the ones I've already presented. So hopefully some of you will take, the, uh, take that opportunity and uh, hope to hear from a range of people, even if you're not a researcher, you know, you're the, probably on the receiving end of research. So we'd love to, love to hear your, your, your perspective on, you know, from that side. So we'll try to, uh, uh, I'll try to keep any Q&A to the end of the talk. So like I say, as we go through, I'd like to focus more on a discussion. And, you know, if you do have Q&A type questions, we can cover those at the end. Okay, so the first track I'll play for you is called Pushing the Envelope. So imagine the following conversation. Um, somebody who requests, wants research, they say, come to a researcher and they say, you know, could you conduct research on X, where X could be you know, any topic or design? Um, and the researcher says, sure, I can do that. But I think we should also include Y in, in the um, research, because Y is very closely related to X. Now, a common uh, response would be no. And for one of these reasons, so the person may say, you know, topic Y is not in the scope of our sprint or our team or our company or whatever. Uh, or they may say, you know, we don't, we don't need to ask about X because we already know what users think about X. Or they may say, you know, we don't want to uh, look at design Y because we just want to make sure that our, our design X is good enough. That's all we're concerned about. Or they may say, you know, design, you know, design Y is a great idea, but it's not feasible. You know, the maybe it's not feasible due to schedule or technology or, you know, policy or, or whatever reason. So now when research, re researchers hear no, I think we have an opportunity and maybe a duty to kind of push back on that or to push the envelope as I'm calling it here. Uh, and that's really what I'm going to talk about in this track. Uh, now, here's a way to visualize what I'm talking about. So when a requester you know, you know, sees a need for research, you know, they may see it as having a certain scope, you know, shown as X here. But when they describe that to the researcher, the researcher sometimes feels, well, they're not really looking at the full picture. Like to really get more, the most value from the research, they ought to take a, a wider perspective, you know, which is shown as Y here. 
Um, so the question is, how as a researcher can we, you know, work with the requester to get them to you know, take that wider view? So the approach I take is uh, I think of this as kind of as a journey of three steps uh, as a researcher. So I, I want to try to get agreement from the requester that it's okay to collect data on Y. Like, you know, the world will not end if we collect data on Y. Uh, and then once we have the data, get them to consider the results and 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 uh, you know agree what what they're telling us, uh, and then finally to to act on the results. So I'll illustrate this journey with uh, kind of a couple of case studies. Um, so in this first case, uh, the requester was an executive, um, and they they told me one day they said, uh, "I'm here. We have this new product, and I'm hearing reports from our customers that they're complaining about it. In particular." They're complaining about part A of our product. So I'd like you to do some research to really understand what are customers' concerns with part A of our product. So I said, well, should we also ask about part B, the other part of the product? And the executive says, no, um, we're hearing complaints about part A, so let's uh, focus on that. So here's how I went through the journey in this particular case. So the, the first step was to try to get data collected on B, on part B. And uh, the way that happened was I was uh, creating an interview guide for part A. And I realized, well, you know, we're, we're gonna have some time left over in, our, in the time we have allotted to interview people. So, you know, there's no harm, you know, if we have time at the end to ask about part B. So I created the interview guide and sent it to the executive, uh, inviting him to review it. But I, I never heard back. And, and I wasn't too surprised about that because he's, he's very busy and you know he, he probably just wanted to hear back you know, when there's some data to share. So I went ahead and uh, uh, interviewed our customers with that interview guide and came back a few weeks later with the results. Uh, and I presented results for party and B and the executive didn't, didn't blink. Uh, I'm, I imagine he probably forgot that you know, sometime before he'd said he, you know, he, he wasn't interested in part B. But uh, there's a good thing too, because uh, the, it turns out the results show that the main complaints customers had were in fact with part B. Um, and uh, when the executive heard that, he was you know, certainly took the results to heart and went on right to the next step, which was to act on them. So he put an action plan in place to address those uh, concerns. So here's another example of going through that journey. So this time, this concerns a, uh, a scrum team, and they'd come up with a design in their sprint, and they came to me and said, we'd like you to do a usability, usability test of this design that we just came up with. So I said, sure. Uh, and I looked at the design, and, and an idea came to me for an enhancement. And so I, I shared that with the team, and they said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So I said, you know, why, why don't we include that in the uh, usability test? We'll get feedback on that as well. And they said, uh, yeah, no, no, thanks. We just need all our goal. Our goal here is simply just to validate that, validate that our design that we came up with is, is good enough. So I said, well, how about, yeah, I understand you, know, you don't want to take the, the resource and time to, to explore this enhancement. What if I do that myself? I'll make the materials, I'll get the feedback and I won't have any impact on your, on your project. So they said, sure, yeah, knock yourself out. Uh, as long as you're, uh, you know, we're, we're not impacted and we're clear that we're, we're not committing to to uh, delivering this enhancement. So I said, sure. So when I did the research, came back, and the results showed that their, the design they came up with was definitely good enough. They met their goal, but that the uh, enhancement, you know, made it even better. Like people really liked the enhancement that we in our test. Uh, so when the team saw that, they were, they changed their mind and they. Uh, they agreed to uh, you know, sort of deliver the enhancement after all. So that was the uh, journey. So, uh, so in this track then, I talked about a situation where uh, a researcher suggests that they request that they take a wider view to get more value from the research. Uh, and even though the initial answer is often no, you, you, as shown by the examples, you know, we can sometimes or maybe often turn it around and and help the team take that wider view of the research to get more value from it. So that's it for this track. Um, and what I'd like to do now is have a little poll, which I will get started here.
here we go. So I hope you can see the poll now. So what I'd like, like to uh, hear from all of you is, uh, I'm sure many of you have been in this situation and uh, uh, you, you've either heard heard no as a researcher or if you said no as somebody who's, uh, uh, you know, whose job it is to say yes or no. Um, so it'd be interesting to see like, wh which of these reasons for, for hearing no that uh, are, the, are the most common ones. So just, just go through and just, you know, anytime you've come across these, just, uh, you know, select those. We'll give people a few moments to, uh, to go through this. I wonder if some people will not be able to answer this because they don't have experience of that. Yeah. Yeah. So I've, I've included I that, that as have... an option at the end there to say, you know, not, not applicable if don't. Uh, right. The spirit. <clears throat> so we'll give people a couple more seconds, but we're, I think we're 12 out of 18. Come on, people, vote. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll leave it there. So let's have a look at the results. Here are the results, and the winner is, oh yes, topic-wise, not in scope, That's a classic for sure. Um, I'm surprised no one said we already know about topic-why. I hear that all the time. Oh, didn't we do a study on that last year? We already know what those people think. Um, that's interesting. So yeah. <clears throat> okay, so what I'd like to do now is uh, see if anybody would like to either share their perspective on this topic or share an experience that they've had, you know, maybe one of these. And uh, let me just get my, so may, maybe a way to do it is um, if you could, if, if, if you'd like to speak, maybe quote unquote, raise your hand. So go go into the, uh, I guess the, what are the, I've got some different view here, but the, uh, the reactions uh, menu and there's a, I think a raise your hand feature and I can see it here. I can call on people. Anybody have a perspective on if you know, in, in research if if the requester says no no oh Thomas please please would you please are you unmuted there oh yeah. hello hi Thomas hey. yes we can hear hey. you great okay great um, so I voted the uh, solution is not feasible so mm -hmm. I mean if like product manager coming or engineering team comes back saying it's not feasible. Is it really worth for us to kind of do research on? Right. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I will ask some, someone else to answer that. If someone wants, does someone think, uh, what do people think is, is if, if, the, if the design doesn't seem feasible, is it worthwhile doing research on it or not? Anybody want to weigh in on that? Well, uh, Tony here, I mean, yeah, Tony. Uh, I, I think it's still worth it because oftentimes uh, um, still being able to define a vision, um, even though technologically something may not be possible right now or, or there isn't the funding for it or other things have been prioritized ahead of it. If the research can find out that it is something really uh, wanted or preferred, then at least it can become a roadmap item. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so I would I would say something similar. So there's there's all kinds of degrees of not feasible. There's like like just this can't ever possibly be done ever, or it's just can't be done in the next two weeks or the next you know two months. Uh, so certainly if it's more in the well, we just can't do it right now. Uh, it's certainly you know I've, I've certainly advocated for for testing it anyways. Uh, but if they say you know just this just you know can't ever ever be done then. There's more of a case for, for not uh, not doing it. Good, that's a good uh, comment. Can there. I add something? Yes, please do. Uh, I think also um, often a solution can be achieved in different ways. And so if it's not feasible a certain way, um, 
if we find out it's worthwhile, we might be creative and come up with a different way of implementing it. That would still get us a lot of the benefits without actually, you know, breaking the feasibility barrier. So I think, especially if we have enough cycles in the research to, to add X, to learn more information. Absolutely. Good, good. Yeah, that's great, good. Great, last call for any comments? Good, good, yeah. Yeah, so just to add a final talk to that. So, so one use of showing people something that's not feasible is, uh, you know, it acts as a prompt and you can maybe learn something from them. You know, when they look at that, you may get some response from them that would help you understand, well, okay, we can't build this thing, but they just told us something interesting that, uh, you know, give, gives us some idea for something that's more feasible that, that, that as Alona said, would, would sort of uh, tr try to address the same need. So, yeah, so yeah, so definitely. Uh, Great, thanks. Okay, good. All right, so let's move on then. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so the next track I'll play for you is called Transforming Questions. So imagine you're a researcher uh, speaking to a designer that we'll call John. And John says, you know, I've designed this page that we're seeing on the screen here. Uh, it describes the eligibility criteria for all, all the programs that our company offers, as well as provides some additional information. Um, so I've reviewed this with uh, some team members and stakeholders, and here's the questions slash concerns that they had. So uh, one of the people I, uh, in, who reviewed this said, you know, is the, this amount of information going to overwhelm our users? Uh, someone else asked about, you know, is the way that the eligibility criteria are presented, is that the right way? Uh, and finally, someone commented on one of the points in the additional information about, and they said, you know, do we really need to include that point about the digital signature? So John continues and says, um, I'd like you to do some research to address these questions. And I've even come up with the questions I'd like you to ask users. So you can just you know, go ahead and do a survey and, and ask users these questions. So my question to you then is, what do you think of these questions, of John's questions? Are these, ready, are these questions ready to ask users? So let's do a poll and see what you think. Okay, good. I think we've got everybody who's going to, to do it. Oh, thank you. Okay, last call for for answers. All right. Let's have a look. Oh, it's a tough crowd. Geez, very critical. So uh, yeah, so I guess most people thought that these uh, questions could benefit from some more work. And that's my view as well. Okay. So let's stop that and move on. Oops. I did share them, didn't I? Stop sharing. Sorry. Okay, good. We'll come back to this. But uh, so that uh, that example was a, uh, uh, or that point, I guess, was an example of the, the, the value of transforming questions, you know, taking the initial, you know, initial draft of the question and transforming it in some way to, to make it a more useful question to, to present to participants, so to get more value from the, 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 uh, the data. So by the, by the term uh, transform, I'm, you know, it's a very general nebulous term, but it could mean any of these things here, clarifying the questions, refining them, reframing them, elaborating on, on them, enriching them with some context, uh, extending them to adjacent topics and, and other things. So you know, any, 
any way you could imagine to take some question and try and improve upon it. So what I'd like you to do, to do now is give some thought to these initial questions to the reviewers and uh, people said, uh, you know, many of you thought these, these questions could use a lot of work. So I'd like to maybe hear some more specific, specifics about what that would be. So if we can go in the, in the chat, in the Zoom chat and just uh, maybe type in a few, some ideas of how you'd like to improve these questions. So, uh, and when you do that, if you could just preface your comment with the, the question number like Q1, you know, such and such and Q2. So we'll just uh, give people a few moments to type in their thoughts that we'll then pass to John to on how we can improve on these questions. Good. All right. We'll give people a few more seconds to share anything that they, they would like. Good. All right. Well, thanks everyone for your, your thoughts. What I'd like to do next then is take you through how I would uh, handle the situation. And that's, and that's based on something I actually did do in a, in a fairly similar situation. So first thing I would do is look at the design and try to identify, uh, you know, find some way to organize the questions. But, you know, uh, and, you know, but, you know, firstly, by starting trying, trying to identify parts of the design or topics to cover. Uh, so when I look at the design, I see two main parts of sort of the top part and the bottom part there. Um, and then when I look at the questions, I try to s figure out which, you know, what question applies to what part. So the, the first question is, 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 the, if, is the amount of information overwhelming? So I think that question could be, you know, addressed to the, the top part and the bottom part sort of separately. Uh, the second question is, is this the right way to present eligibility criteria? So that has to do with the, the top part. And the, the, the um, third question is about digital signatures. So, so that introduces a new part of topic, which I've highlighted here. It's one of the bullets in the additional information. So I would sort of think of, think of a new heading and, and put that under there. And this is kind of what we end up with. So I have a bit of an outline that says, you know, here, here's the, the parts of the design or the topics, and here's all the questions that are that pertain to those. So that that starts to give us a way, to, like, would we uh, present questions or participants to sort of focus on one thing at a time and, and ask about, you know, that thing before moving on? Pardon me. Uh, next, I'd look. We'll look at some of the questions individually. So. Uh, one of these questions is, is this the right way to present eligibility criteria? So when I hear people use the term, the phrase, is this the right way or is this good enough? Uh, I immediately think, well, compared to what? Uh, and that, that sort of transformed the question into comparing the design that we're interested in to some other alternative. Uh, so the strategy I would use is to work with the team to come up with at least one alternative to the the design that we're, we're talking about, and then pr present that to users along with some questions to find out about their satisfaction with these different uh, options and, or their, which one they prefer. Uh, and doing that, we can come back with data that says, you know, the answer to the question would be, 
yes, this is the right way because it's as good or better than the other ways that we try to do it. Uh, and the final point we'll cover is uh, this question here is, should we include the, the point about digital signatures? You know, yes or no? Uh, so for this kind of question, uh, it seems to me that, like the way to, to really address it is to understand people's underlying attitudes towards providing their digital signature. So uh, some, some attitudes that are relevant are, you know, are people concerned with doing this? Like how concerned are people with providing a signature? Uh, and if they are concerned, like what's the nature of their concern? Are they concerned more with kind of privacy slash security issues or ease of use or some other thing? Uh, and then based on that, I, create craft some questions to try to answer those questions. And in doing that, uh, something interesting happens is we actually sort of reframe the question. So it's no longer a, a yes or no question uh, in the sense that, we, as we'll see, yes is really isn't sort of a, a valid option. The, the options really turn out to be, uh, if you're going to keep it, we, we, it's really about improving it because you know if people are very concerned about this, I think that this wording would be far from you know adequate to addressing their concerns. So the, the issue is, do we need to improve this wording because people are concerned about it, or can we just take it out because you know people you know have no concerns; they don't need to be you know t told about this. Good. So uh, so this track talked really about uh, taking some initial questions and transforming transforming them to make them more useful uh, to get you know more value from the research. And, and as I mentioned from the examples, uh, you know, transforming can take many, many forms, but it's, it's a matter of finding something that's uh, you know, suitable for the situation you're in. So I'll turn it over to you now and I'll would love to hear if anybody has any sort of comments on this perspective or examples they wanna share or anything along those lines. Again, you could put your hand up or just uh, just shout out if no one's talking. I, either will do. So I'm sure you know, anybody who's done any research whatsoever is kind of when, when they have first seen the questions posed, you know, posed the, like the, you know, the, hey Paul oh, Lee Lee, yeah, and and I guess. You know, from a product manager's perspective, this is really interesting because because um, <clears throat> we don't often sort of step back to to try to remove our biases and assumptions, but but you know, in doing proper discovery, you really want to open yourself up to different perspectives and different interpretations, and so you need to remove that leading any kind of leading indication of value, right? And, and, and what, what I find, what I found to be most useful there is to not focus on what the outcome is, but to talk about the process or the thinking they're going through. So instead of saying, is this better than that? You, you focus on, tell me how you do this, right? Mm -hmm. And then as somebody describes that process, you look for the emotional inflection points or the pain points and you, Again, you don't value it. You just say, oh, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. And that's really the process of discovering and being curious about opening yourself to new understandings. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's definitely a very key, key sort of mindset and research for sure. Very good, thank you. Anybody uh, have anything else to share? Okay, well, let's move on then. Paul? Yes. Um, what about testing lorem ipsum versus real content? What about it? Well, you know, when people are looking at your uh, proposed design and it has lorem ipsums in it, um, they're not really looking at the content. They're not really, you know, trying to absorb it or understand it. Um, I would. I would suggest that putting some realistic copy in there would be more appropriate in order to get a real reaction. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, the, oh you're talking about the lorem ipsum in my in my example. Yeah, in your example. Oh, oh yeah, that, that was for the purpose of today's presentation. 
Uh, no, but what I'm saying is, would oh, you would you put the Laura Mips in there, or would you put in some real con? Real oh, oh, oh the, the the real version of this. Um, okay, there's all kinds of you know, you know, gorpy detail for sure. The real copy goes in. Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. This is just I just wanted to you know for the purpose of today, I just want to make the point that I, I wanted to call it one of the particular points there. In the, I want to convey the fact that there's a lot of stuff in there, and, and one could imagine why somebody may say, "Hey, this is overwhelming." Um, but not to get into the, the, the details. But yeah, that's a good point. Um, funny story about that, actually. So I was doing a, a study and for, for maybe not good reasons, we had some lorem ipsum in our uh, mock-up. Uh, you know, it was mostly like real stuff, but there's some stuff that was lorem ipsum because we, we, we didn't think people were gonna, it was sort of, it wasn't the main point of the study, but someone started reading it and they said, and they were really struggling to read it and they said, I don't think this is English. Is this, is this a different language? So it's funny how you can even, you know, experienced people can sort of forget, you know, the experience of, of somebody coming at this, you know, as a user and kind of how, how they'll experience it. Anyway, side note. Okay, let's move on here. Oh, that's the end of side A. I have to, Bear with me while I turn the tape over. Good. Okay. So on side B, we're going to focus on something a little different. We'll look at uh, um, answers to the research question, specifically how to package and present results in a way that provides the most value to their the audience. And uh, so, oops, so the first track there was, was called Protecting Freedom. Okay. So teams commonly need to identify whether their customers prefer option A or B. And these options could be experiences like do customers prefer banking online or banking in person? Or they could be designs like do would a customer prefer seeing all this content in a big long scrolling list or would they prefer to see it grouped in tabs? Uh, and the, the type of question, uh, the type of question for answering, you know, because the type of scale for answering this kind of question is a comparative rating scale, such as the one shown here. And I've, I'm showing two flavors, sort of a, a five-point scale and a, a three-point scale. Um, and I would like to know from you now, if you were uh, putting a, a scale together to ask whether customers preferred option A or B, would you tend to use a five-point scale or a three-point scale or which? So let me just fire up this poll and we'll see what people think. So there's the poll. I've got the, these two options, five point and three point and some other options as well. So let's see what, what you would do. My option's not in there. Well, in, do, do tell four point scale because it makes them polarize and nobody can sit in the middle. Oh, good one, good one. Yeah. All right. Okay. Last call for, for votes. And let's see. Hey, Paul, my, mine's not in there either because I think this is testing people's opinion, not their actual behavior, but that's just yeah. my bias. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm interested in your opinion. Tell me, tell me your opinion. Let's make a scale. What are we going to use? Okay. All right. Let's have a look at the results then. Five-point scale. Fantastic. And uh, well, just one one lonely person on the seven points. I, I've I've done this uh, before, and uh, seven-point scales are, are quite popular among the more bespoke researchers. So, that's always a common. My initial version of this, I didn't have seven point scale in there, and someone complained, You don't have seven point scale. Like, why not? So I added this in here. So, yeah, so five point scale is a very common scale and very popular here. But nevertheless, I'm going to try to convince you that a three point scale is actually better in this case. So let's, let me try and do that. Okay, so. A common thing we want when we deliver uh, results or receive results is precision, you know, more precise results. And on that basis, a five-point scale is clearly better than a three-point scale. But I'm still 
I'm still going to try to convince you that uh, a three-point scale is better here. And uh, to see why, let's start by, by looking at some hypothetical data. So uh, with a five-point scale, that allows you to measure people who somewhat prefer option A or B. And uh, as is already alluded to earlier, uh, if when you take those options away, that the people who somewhat prefer an option, they have to choose between stating that they strongly prefer the option or do they have no preference at all? Uh, and that sort of, I guess, quandary or conundrum is uh, illustrated by this quote at the bottom, which is actually an actual quote I, from a recent study I did. So they said, so someone was looking at some options and they said, well, you know, to me, option A is a little better than option B, but it's not much better. So I'm gonna choose no preference. And I'm actually gonna argue that that's actually a strength of the, the three-point scale. Uh, so the reason I'm I'm advocating for the three-point scale in this kind of situation is that it prefer it preserves freedom of action. So by that I mean, in the case where you know it turns out that people don't really have a strong preference between the two alternatives, um, I think the decision maker should be free to use their judgment to choose the best alternative. You know, say, you know based on their own judgment, uh, and that's really the the point of this track here is to think about uh, when we're crafting questions or presenting results to think about the impact uh, on the decision maker of the way we're packaging it. Uh, so I like to say, like, I, I want the data I produce to inform decisions. I don't want to tie the hands of the decision maker, you know, with the results. Uh, and now the, the point I'm making is not specific to this five point versus three point scale. It's just a very you know, easy example to illustrate it. So I'll show you an, another example. Um, so another common kind of question is trying to uh, identify the top items in a longer list. Um, so for example, like one, one form this question can take is, uh, you know, what subset of my roadmap features should I, I put in the next release? Or if I'm a designer and I'm designing like a quick action area for frequently used uh, actions, what are the three uh, actions I should put in that area? Uh, so the, the most natural way to pose that question is to use a force ranking, and that's where you tell people to rank or sort all the items in, you know, in, in order of something like importance. Uh, but another way is to ask people to rate the, you know, give a rating to each item individually. And choosing between these two ways of presenting the question, you know, it involves the, the same trade-off we just saw uh, previously between more precision and more you know, freedom of action. And to see why, we'll see this with some sample data here. So on the left, we have sample data using a force ranking. And we see here that the top three items are B, F, and G. And force rankings are good that way. They'll, they're, they're guaranteed to be you know, precise and unambiguous. You'll always you know, get a, a direct answer to your question, like what are the top three items? These are the top three items. Um, in contrast with the priority rating, uh, the, the data that are shown there are there's a, a rating from one to five for each item and they're sorted you know, by, uh, by rating. Uh, and you see, we get very similar results. We, we see that uh, the two top items are still B and F. But when, when we get to the third uh, spot, we see there's a kind of a, a virtual tie between item C and G. So uh, with this kind of information, presenting this to the decision maker, that's, that leaves the decision maker free to use their judgment to make the final decision about what item they should include in the, in the third place. Uh, and they may, in, in contrast to the ranking, the, the ranking is, is basically the data tells them to go with item G. They don't really have any say in the matter from uh, in terms of the results. So on that, for that reason, uh, you know, I, pr I prefer using the uh, a priority rating for this sort of question. So in this track, I tried to describe this trade-off here between on the one hand, uh, posing a question or presenting results in a way that are you know, more precise, but they sort of can tie your hands versus an, another way, which is sort of less precise, but it gives people you know, more freedom of action to make a final decision, you know, in the case where it turns out users don't really care between these you know, options or, or whatnot. So turn it over to you and uh, love to hear if, if people agree with this trade-off or not, or, and if they do, you know, how do you address it in your work or where else does that apply or anything else? 
So again, you can either maybe put your hand up if you want to speak or just shout it out. <coughs> Pardon me. So Paul, I'll jump in. I, I really, I like your, your sort of posing of the, the contrast between this and, and to me, you know, it's not, it's not, it, it's, it's sort of the researcher is free to make the final decision, but what criteria is that based on? So like, you know, it's not arbitrary obviously, but, it, but it just means yes, the, the, the feedback from the users is that it didn't make that much of a difference, at least not as much as the other options. So then you as a researcher or, or, or a decision maker, how are you going to make that decision? Yeah, well, that's, that's why they, they pay you the big bucks, right? To make decisions. So, uh, you know, I would say like, like, for example, in a roadmap context, they say, well, you know, given that the top two items are B and F, like an, another, the one that would complement that best would be, you know, G, even though the G wasn't the, like the highest third place, but it, it would make a nice complement to the other ones. Or, you know, users don't care between, you know, these two things, but, you know, B is way cheaper to implement. So, you know, if they don't care one or the other, might, might as well just implement the cheaper one. So yeah, so there's lots of, there's lots of reasons beyond, you know, what users say that, that you know, organizations may want to decide one thing or the other. So, and, and this gives them the kind of the, the license to do that as well. Users aren't going to care one or the other, so. Actually, it makes me curious as a product person to find out why it doesn't matter to, to you. Sure, yeah. Yeah, well, that, yeah. So, so we didn't cover that here, but with with any rating, you you also want to follow that up with, you know, why did you rate it this way? So you'd have some insight in, uh, into to why people were rating things that way. Um, yeah, good. Anybody else uh, want to weigh in on this? Okay. Well, let's move on. Okay, so the next track I'll play for you is called Adding Breathing Room. So when findings are presented to requesters, they expect to see recommendations. And these recommendations can vary in detail from like a, a kind of a bullet point to like a completely revised design. Uh, and the simplest way and most common way that um, findings are presented is to present finding one followed by recommendations to address finding one, then go on to finding two and present recommendations to address finding two and so on through all the findings you know to the end uh, so basically this this approach is what i call you know so basically a one-to-one -one mapping between a finding and a recommendation or a very tight coupling or you know however you might want to phrase it but the the, the findings and recommendations are very kind of closely bound together uh, and in routine cases you know this this approach may be adequate but i find it, it doesn't always deliver the best the most value from the results and that's really what I want to talk about in this track. So let me start by describing a couple of situations I've sometimes observed that suggest that, uh, you know, go, go through all this effort to deliver results, but teams aren't necessarily getting the full value from those results. So the first situation I've sometimes observed is that the audience aren't giving really their full attention to the findings. Uh, what they're really interested in is the recommendations. So they, 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 as the findings are presented, they kind of sit through them impatiently, like it's kind of a, the warm-up act. They're waiting for the headliner to come on, uh, and it's unfortunate because this situation, uh, you know, really presents a missed opportunity for the the audience to really Im improve their understanding of kind of what the what the findings are, what, what of their customers basically. Um, the other situation I sometimes find is, or I've observed, is that sometimes researchers when they're preparing their results they, they don't give like their full attention to coming up with the recommendations uh, and that's because you know re researchers by nature are generally focused on generating findings and recommendations don't really come into play till sort of like the last 10 percent of a, a research project you spend you know you know 90 percent of your of the upfront part of the research you know trying to to find questions and, and research goals and materials and collect data and make sense of the data. 
and then you know you're sort of at, at the, almost at the finish line. You're exhausted and say, oh, "Okay, I have to come up with some. I've got this finding now. I need to sort of recommend you know what to do about it." Um, I mean, and I'm I'm in sort of over caricaturizing this here, but just to make the point that definitely some research uh, reports are much stronger on the findings, but then you look at the recommendations. And say, yeah, that's that's an okay recommendation, but surely that's not the best possible solution to the problem. Um, so that's what I want to address here. Uh, and so to address this situation, uh, I, I like to, uh, there's an approach I, I, I call providing breathing room between findings and recommendations. Uh, and it's sort of an, a nebulous concept, but the, the benefit I'm trying to achieve is finding ways to get uh, audiences who otherwise aren't that interested in the findings to, to sort of pay more attention to the findings and, and absorb them to, you know, more deeply. And also, uh, and especially to provide higher quality recommendations. So to illustrate this notion of a breathing room, I'll take you through a few examples and show you sort of the, the various ways and forms it can take and uh, ways it can be used. So one use of a breathing room is to step back from your findings and look at them holistically. And in, in doing that, especially if you have a large number of findings and you, if you look at them holistically, you can start to discern some larger underlying themes that tie some of these findings together. Uh, and when you do that, then you can come up with recommendations that are, um, you know, I would say a more elegant set of recommendations. So you have re recommendations that address a wider swath of the findings. And so you, you need fewer recommendations to do that. Uh, anyway, uh, so that's, that's sort of one, one use of the breathing room. Uh, another use of the breathing room is to uh, deal with controversy. So some find, findings are controversial for different reasons. Uh, one reason could be that there's just simply a miscommunication between the researcher and the audience, like the, um, and that can be you know somewhat easily resolved. Uh, other controversies are more sort of substantial, like the you know the the people on different uh, sides of the issue have different. Uh, you know, facts, to, uh, you know, are bringing different facts to bear. They have different perspectives on the issue or different assumptions or, or whatnot. So a breathing room provides a way to, uh, or a place to kind of resolve that controversy to either, either clarify the finding if it was misunderstood, or maybe as a result of further discussion, you know, the researcher agrees that yes, the, the audience does, you know, uh, uh, does have a better way to sort of cast the finding and the finding can be revised accordingly. Uh, and th th that, and then the recommendation can follow from that revised or improved finding. So with, without a uh, kind of a breathing room, if you have a, a very tight coupling between, okay, finding, recommendation, uh, in, in the event of a, a controversial finding, your, your recommendation is dead in the water because people just aren't buying your, your finding in the first place. So they're surely not going to uh, buy your solution to that finding. So it, uh, it, it'll, it, allows it allows you to keep the recommendation back until people are all aligned on the finding. And then when you present the recommendation, there's, there's a much more receptive audience to, to that. Uh, and finally, the final use of our breathing room is shown here. And there, so sometimes there's, there's a situation where you have a finding and then you come up with an initial recommendation. Uh, and as you're thinking about it, you realize, well, there's some other related considerations that are beyond the scope of the research, but you know, th things of the, the, the team or the business is concerned about. Uh, and you can sort of bring those into play to help justify your recommendation. So in this use of the breathing room, the, the recommendation goes well beyond what's needed for the original finding because it's addressing some other things that the business also considers important, you know, for, you know, you know so, so basically getting sort of a, you know, a better bang for your buck, basically. Good. Okay, so that is uh, the end of the, this uh, track. So what we described here was the practice of trying to find some way to add some breathing space between your findings and recommendations. Uh, and that helps you get more value from both your findings. And people will better understand your findings and absorb them and remember them. Uh, and also uh, helps improve the recommendations so you get a, you know, a better set of recommendations. So that is it. So we will uh, again, invite people to
share your perspective or? Oh, so Paul, I have a question. Uh, is, excuse, is excuse me. Have we heard from you before? No, just yeah, kidding. No. Okay, I'll be very brief. No, no you, you can. No, you, you can. Uh, you can, You're is a good it, role model. Is it your assumption that researchers should be making recommendations, or is that a totally different step? Uh, well, I'm saying it's the it's it, the the mainstream conventional view that uh, researchers make recommendations. Uh, I don't. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I, I, yeah, but you, I guess you have a, a point of view on that. Well, I, I guess, you know, I think, I think there's a huge expertise in research and that's a little different than being an expert in the problem domain to make solutions or to recommend solutions, right? Indeed, I agree. I, I have the same perspective you do on that. But uh, nevertheless, uh, in other, well, uh, other people can surely jump in with their views on this, but yes. Yeah, so, so, I would say I would agree with your point, and also make the point that uh, it's uh, pretty much universal. My experience that uh, it's not it's not a report if there's no recommendations. So, like, go back and come back with some recommendations. Uh, so, so that, that's kind of the expectation for for good good or ill. And I, I will leave it to others to weigh in on whether they think that's good or bad or not. Anybody want to weigh in on that? Well, sure, I'll, I'll jump in. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think it's, it never hurts to have recommendations, right? I mean, at least it's something that other people can reflect on and react to. They don't necessarily have to be accepted um, as they're um, presented. Right. So um, they could just be, again, another step in the process, right? And the ultimate decision makers are the people who are actually implementing, um, who may have a different set of experiences or skill sets can you know reject the recommendations take the recommendations or adapt them as they see fit um so i'll throw that out there and and be curious to see what other um what perspectives other folks may have good thank you mark good anybody else does anybody here do research reports that uh, don't have recommendations If specifically asked to do so, sometimes uh, they ask just for the findings. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, so I would say, like, like there's. Uh, hey, hey, Paul. Deborah, yeah, sure. Deborah, Deborah has a question. Deborah, sorry, I didn't see your hand there. Deborah, put your hand up. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say that um, in design thinking, if you're not the subject matter expert in the, you know, in the scope of what your research is, um, you can then, um, rather than present a report of findings, you can bring the findings into um, a session where everybody is, is uh, coming up with solutions and recommendations. Um, from, you know, the decision makers and the subject matter experts and um, the researchers working together, representing a lot of the stakeholders in, in that uh, sense making. Right, good. Well, that, yeah, that's a great, uh, great practice. Yeah, and, that, and that's a great great illustration of a, kind of a, what I would call a, you know, a breathing room is like putting some sort of space between one mode of okay, um, coming up with, uh, you know, what does this mean? And separately, or, or maybe I'm, I'm misrepresenting what you said, but the notion of Switching between, uh, you know, making sense of what the data means uh, versus, you know, what are we going to do about it? Um, Paul, I, I, I'll be very brief, but I would just add one more comment, which I see a lot in in different ventures, and that's and that's that as humans, we're uncomfortable with uncertainty, and so we immediately jump to solutions before we truly understand the problem. And so I think part of our role and what I advocate with product managers is get people to focus on the problem and really understand that deeply before you start to assume the solutions, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, yeah, I guess in my, my experience, my practice, like I, uh, I do, I have that same concern that Lee mentioned that, you know, just because I'm a researcher doesn't make me an authority on, on sort of, you know, the best recommendations. So I do, uh, 
I do try to engage other people that are that have other perspectives as a relevant expertise in coming up with recommendations, uh, and you know make sure I, I vet those before you know, presenting them in too official a form. But uh, uh, that, that's definitely uh, that. anyway. But yeah, so there is I think there is quite a sort of the the view you sometimes get uh, you know or is that you know that, that recommendations are easy to. To, to sort of come up with, you know, as, you know, as an afterthought, the findings is, I, I think, not a good one. So I think, like, coming up with the recommendations is its own thing, and uh, you can be great at, you can be great at uh, coming up with findings or great with coming up with recommendations, but you know, being good at one doesn't mean you're necessarily good at the other. And I maybe, think maybe the role, maybe the role for a researcher is to present the findings and then provide a context for possible solutions as opposed to making recommendations. Yeah, no, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other thing I, I sort of glossed over here, but at least in my experience, a lot of uh, work I do is there's there's not the researchers, the research team, and the research team has many relevant or disparate uh, uh, types of expertise on the team. So there's someone who's very, knows the technology or someone who's, you know, good with sort of the, you know, sort of the, the UI design pieces of it. So. Uh, the research team as a whole may have the, the skills to come up with good recommendations. But um, anyway, yeah, so there's a lot, lots of different flavors to this for sure. Uh, any f final final comment on this subject? One, one point is I have heard it said that uh, people who are coming up with the recommendations should have been present during the research so that the context is not delivered by a researcher, but actually experienced primary in the primary uh, research opportunity with the actual users. And then that they have a much stronger context and therefore they can come up with a much better option for recommendations. Yeah. And that's, that would be really cool if you could yeah. get that. Yeah. Well, yeah, and yeah, that, that's, that's a good point as well. Uh, and yeah, so I, I guess I, I did have this unspoken assumption that there's a research team who's there from you know cradle to grave, um, and it's not just the researcher, uh, because as you mentioned, whoever's coming up the research or with the recommendations needs to be immersed in sort of the findings and why we got there and what was the data about, like what data sort of, you know came to those findings or what assumptions were made or mm -hmm. what perspectives were taken or whatnot, and, and also what what the goals of the the research were in the first place. Um, so, good. Okay. Let's... Oops, sorry. Oh, that's the end of side B. Good. So that concludes my talk. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, so I guess we can, well, well, see if there's any, any further questions or comments and we can, uh, when we're done with those, we, we can go to our more informal part of the the uh, event where people stick around after just for for discussion. So that was any... exactly an hour, exactly. Wow, well done. that's awesome! Thank you. Well measured. <laughs> Good. Well, my my tape only lasts ninety minutes, so mm -hmm. or it was an hour tape actually. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, good. Okay. Any final comments, questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. Very nicely uh, packaged. Thank you so much, Paul. For thank you. For putting this together was very, very engaging, thought provoking and uh, great. Yeah, great, thank you. Nice. Uh...